Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, just to add that at the time when I wrote here, period, I had an acoustics department and I learned a lot from Doc Stevens. But one of the reasons why I got into Imperial was because I went there and I found the admissions tutor was very friendly. When I'd been there for a week, I discovered he was head of the acoustics department. So uh, that, was, that was a good start. Um, just to begin with, uh, I want to say a little bit about the organ itself. I'm not going to give you a rundown of the acoustics of the organ, but just uh, tell you a little bit about the organ as a musical instrument. Uh, first of all, most people don't realise that the very first organ was made to 200 years BC by a Greek engineer living in Alexandria. Um, and so it was the first keyboard instrument. Um, the organs are mostly very small, except that by just before the Norman Conquest, a monk wrote about the organ in this very church, saying that when it was, pulled, when it was played flat out, it was deafening. Um, virtually all the organs that existed uh, up to uh, Henry VIII were destroyed and there was another bout of destruction uh, in the Commonwealth thanks to Oliver Cromwell. Except Oliver Cromwell of course, uh, like all good dictators, they destroyed most of the organs but he took the one out of um, Magdalen College Chapel in Oxford and moved to the Hampton Court for people to dance. Um, the basic sound of an organ comes from uh, two sorts of pipe. Uh, the first sort, which are the most numerous, are like a, a recorder. In other words, you have air going across the mouth, vibrating across the mouth, and that vibration is amplified and controlled by the resonance of the air in the length of the pipe. And the second sort also have an air in the length of the pipe, but it is excited not by the vibration of air, but by of a, a mechanical reed, rather as you have it a clarinet or a saxophone. Uh, one of the things about an organ which distinguishes it from every other instrument is that in, all, in every other instrument you've got a uh, woodwind instrument, you've got one pipe that has to do duty for many notes. Uh, and that tends to make the basses soft and rather edgy, and the trebles loud and rather fluty. With an organ, each resonator is playing one note only, and then it could be optimised for that one note. And that, over the centuries, led to an increase in what the acoustician would call the frequency spectrum of the organ. Um, and we'll show you later on uh, that uh, we've ended up with uh, going down from 16 hertz, go up from 16 hertz up to 8 kilohertz. Uh, you've got the complete range, or audible range. There is in fact one organ in the world, in Australia, which goes down an octave lower and the lowest note beats 8 cycles per second. Whether that is a musical note or not is a matter of argument. The organ also has a very wide dynamic range, um, it, but it is the only instrument whose design is varied according to the acoustics of the building in which it is housed. Other instruments either have some method of adjusting their sound, such as raising the lid of a grand piano, or present in greater or less numbers, as in the contrast between a string quartet and a full 80-piece orchestra. Not for nothing does St Paul's Cathedral have more boy treble singers than any other English cathedral. Before the acoustic of the Royal Festival Hall was altered, the leading orchestras often had 12 double bass players all soaring away in a vain effort to make themselves heard uh, because the Festival Hall was so deficient in bass. What I'm going to look at this evening is the musical requirements for the acoustic power of an organ. Let's look at the next slide. The musical requirements for the acoustic power of an organ 
the effect that the acoustic has on the fulfilment of those requirements, and the tools that organ designers have at their disposal for coping with the varying circumstances. The first thing is you don't want the organ to be too loud. And I quote there, and I'll come back to this, an organ that when first built was definitely too loud. You also don't want an organ that's too soft. And that is an organ which unfortunately is too soft and nobody's been able to do anything about it so far. And uh, you've also got a problem of getting the bass treble between the low frequency and high frequency, the treble and bass, getting the balance right. And famously, that was wrong in 1972, and that organ has now been replaced by another one. So, what sizes do organs come in? You've got house organs, um, which were made for uh, people's private... In the, in the 18th century, it was the fashionable thing to have for the newly wealthy to have a music room with a little organ in it, uh, either to be played solo or with a group of strings. It didn't need a lot of power, and the fact that it was a heavy case is not a problem. And this picture is one of the grandest of the lot. It was... Um, it was uh, built in 1775 by a very wealthy Welsh businessman for his house in St James's Square, London, uh, with a case by Robert Adam, uh, and it is now in the National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. And of course, uh, all, you can of course make them, uh, if you've got a room with low absorption, you can make a small organ work in a larger room. And the classic case of this is an organ that was made for a private house in Dublin and which is now in the Holywell Music Room in Oxford, um, which, if you don't know it, is about the size of this choir, um, but with a, a very excellent acoustic for a small uh, musical force, as you see in that, in that picture. And then the smallest size of organs you come across, which are very much made today, are portable box organs. Sorry, let me find somewhere to lose that. Um, the, they're much used if you, for bark cantatas, handles, music, and so on. Um, and the great thing about that is that, of course, the player can look over the organ at the conductor. Uh, that means, of course, they have a very limited power in the bass because you can't have any very big pipes. Um, one interesting thing is that so I was talking to a musician at the weekend who had been hired to play such an instrument in St. Martin's of the Fields for a performance of the Foreign Requiem. Uh, he was very disappointed he wasn't allowed to play the big organ. But the conductor said, oh, no, I want you to play this little one so, that, so I can see you. Um, but for Foreign, it was the wrong organ. Um, so while we're talking about concerts, let's go on to concert hall organs. Now the challenge with a concert hall organ is to get them loud enough. There's music in the concert repertoire, such as Saint-Saëns' Third Symphony, that calls for a concert hall organ to be able to come through the sound of full, full orchestra. Now the problem is that symphony orchestras have become steadily larger and louder over the last 200 years, even, even the last 50. So this can cause a real problem. Um, Henry Willis, who built this organ originally, and I'll come back to that in a moment, um, built an organ for the Albert Hall in London in 1871. It was famously not loud enough um, because it couldn't match up to the orchestra. Uh, this was rectified in the 1920s, when the organ was rebuilt with higher wind pressures, and I'll come to that later on. More recently, the 1996 organ in the Bridgewater Hall of Manchester has proved to be seriously underpowered, and the organ in the picture in Symphony Hall, uh, Birmingham, is just about loud enough. If you hear it upstairs, it is. If you hear it from the stalls, it's only just. Um, now, the requirements 
of church rules vary. The, the requirements in different countries, the different denominations, the requirements have changed over the centuries in response to changes in, in, in the practice of, uh, of the liturgy of the church. But the basic thing that's required of an organ in the church is to lead the singing of the congregation. You've got to have enough power to lead the singing of the congregation. And this can vary. Um, if you go to a funeral, most people don't sing very well. They're probably not used to singing in churches. And they're always a bit nervous at, at, at funerals. So crematoria don't need very loud organs. On the other hand, if you go to the chapel of Winchester College or any other of the leading independent schools, the boys all sing in the innocent at the top of their voice. And if you don't have a loud organ, loud organ they'll drown it. So uh, the requirement does vary, and you do have to be aware of that. And I've got a particular problem at the moment. Uh, there's a new organ in, um, in a church in Wiltshire, um, which is used by a music festival two Sundays a year, and by the parish 50 Sundays a year. The music festival produces a choir of 45, the church normally has a choir of 15. So you've got this argument as to how loud it should be. Um, I've got to go there next week and try and settle it. Um, so let's come now to external factors that affect the sound of an organ. And the first one is, is the whole question of where you put it. The largest piece of furniture in the building, the placement of the organ is subject to both liturgical and architectural fashion. In most non-conformist chapels, the organ is placed at the front on the major axis of the building. And up to the middle of the 19th century, the standard position in Anglican churches was on the major axis at the back, the so-called West End. And in cathedrals, you normally had a screen between the nave and the choir. This, fire, this thin screen that you have now is, is, is um, Victorian. But before that, you had a, a much more substantial screen, and you normally had the organ actually sitting on the screen. Um, the abolition of the substantial screens uh, has been a problem. Uh, in, some church, in some cathedrals, they still exist. Norwich has still got the organ on the screen, so that's uh, um, But in others, they, the organ has been pushed to one side. And um, I was talking earlier to your assistant director of music here, uh, and about the organ at Worcester Cathedral. At Worcester, uh, when they pushed the organ to one side, uh, they pushed it low down under the arches, either side, and then put it on high wind pressure to try and get the sound down the building. And the result was that the choir were absolutely deafened. And what had happened with the new organ, which we'll come to a little later on, um, was that we put it up much higher, so that the sound is much more widely distributed. Over, over, the, over, over the people. Um, and one of the things that happened in the Church of England was in the middle of the 19th century they decided that they wanted to have, uh, instead of having singers at the back in Mafia, they wanted to dress the singers up in cassocks and surplices and put them at the front, just like they do it, they've always done in cathedrals. And that meant pushing the organ to the side, uh, and that caused a lot of problems, um, because they put them in the organ chambers. Uh, and there you see an organ that's been pushed into an organ chamber. Um, it's since been moved, but that's how it was until quite recently. A major difficulty, of course, is that visual issues usually receive priority attention. I think this is at least partly caused by a general ignorance of acoustic principles, including sound amongst architects. And I'm going to show you another picture. No, that's not a music venue. It's a building designed for show, for bling. Deliberately impressive. The acoustics are completely ignored. It has hard-wearing marble wall surfaces and very low acoustic absorption. So when the train comes in, you're deafened. It is a station on Moscow Underground. 
for those who enjoy. Um, coming to music venues, the classic consequence of this attitude can be found in the Colston Concert Hall in Bristol, where the hidden organ speaks largely into the roof space. In the Royal Festival Hall in London, the organ consultant Mace Downs fought a long battle over the location of the organ, where a similar roof space position was originally proposed. Uh, he won the battle, which is why you can see the organ right across behind the orchestra. Uh, one of the problems lies in the very wide frequency range of the organ. I've mentioned that large organs typically go down to 16 hertz, and nearly all organs go up to at least 8 kilohertz. And I think this is the point where, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I will disappear and give you a demonstration. Very low nature of the herd, you have no idea where it was coming from, and it bounces evenly around the building because the wavelength is much higher, longer than the wavelength of any of the obstructions. So the sound goes around corners quite happily. Uh, and our ears are not far enough apart to detect the exact direction of sound. But when you get to those high notes, it's a very different issue because they'll be, unless they're directed, redirected by a reflective surface, and in this building there are a lot of reflective surfaces, they will be quite attenuated. Um, and that can be a problem in terms of the treble bass balance. 
But this is why organ position doesn't matter too much in a very reverberant building, because you're not really conscious of where the sound is coming from. But it's more important in a non-reverberant building. But even so, there's a problem in these cathedrals. Um, the story of this organ, by the way, is that it was built for the Great Exhibition of 1851 and bought by Winchester Cathedral. It's been altered a bit and enlarged since then, but it dates back to 1851. Um, most cathedrals are used like two buildings end to end. You get a lot of services held in this area, and then you get the odd, really big service where you fill the nave with people. And some cathedrals get over this by having two organs or a little bit of extra organ down the nave. Uh, and they had the problem here and about 20 years ago, the bit of organ that you see over there was added to try and get the sound down the nave. Uh, my impression is it, it wasn't far enough down and it doesn't really work. But they, they, they try, that's what they tried to do here. Um, all right, let's move on to the next point, which is where does the player stand? Well, of course, he's got to have contact with the other musicians. And then this uh, gives rise to all sorts of visual and architectural considerations. Um, for example, uh, Canterbury Cathedral have worn out their organ and plan to have a new one. And the order hasn't been placed for the new one because there is an almighty row going on as to where the organ player is going to sit. And the architects want it in one place and the musicians say, no, it's useless. Until they sort that one out, nothing's going to happen. Uh, but it does, it does affect, uh, it is desirable to have a player in good location to the other musicians. Now, one of the things that happened uh, well, over 100 years ago was uh, a low voltage electric action was developed to enable the separation of the player from the instrument. Um, and this is the chap who invented it, Mr. Robert Hope Jones, demonstrating his electric action removable console in the porch of St. John's Church, Birkenhead in 1887. Um, he was a very clever inventor and as you can see from the picture he was a good publicist. He turned out to be a bad bus businessman. In 1904 he fled his creditors and went to the United States uh, where after bouncing around a bit he ended up with a company that you might have heard of called the Rudolf Wurlitzer Company who used his ideas to, to create organs suitable for the accompaniment of the silent films. Uh, and the Wurlitzer organ, um, which was developed for that. Um, the problem with that is illustrated in the picture. Well, musically, what's the point of playing the organ from, from the position in the church porch anyway? You can't hear what you're doing. Uh, but they did try putting the organ at, the, at one end of the building and the player and the choir at the other end, and it doesn't work. You've got. Two problems, really. If the organ is 34 metres from the player, you've got a 100 millisecond acoustic delay. So you start playing things fast, it's difficult. Secondly, the distant organ is soft to the player. And if the player is further from the organ, if the listeners are mostly nearer the organ than the player, and it's a building that's non reverberant so the sound is very directional, they're going to claim Mike Billy and he plays too loudly. It's a lesser problem in a reverberant building because the sound doesn't diminish so much with, with, with distance. Um, we now know that uh, a 12 metre se separation is, is, is acceptable. Um, and that is. Um, that's an example of the uh, nearly new organ in Worcester Cathedral, where from the keys, which you can see in the picture there, to the parts in the organ is about 12 metres. By the way, I'll tell you a little story about that picture, or other pictures that you can derive from this is, do not think that the pipes that you see are all there are. 
they, they are only the, some of the base pipes. There are a lot more pipes, pipes behind. And famously, when uh, Coventry Cathedral was designed, Basil Spence did a lovely sketch, which is still preserved, uh, of how he wanted the organ pipes to look. And then he went to see the organ builder, Cuthbert Harrison, and said, this is how I want it to look. And Cuthbert Harrison said, yes, but where do we put all the rest of the pipes? He said, what all the rest of the pipes? <laughs> so they had to make the cathedral seven feet longer. <laughs> Bresel's French referred to the Cuthbert Harrison's seven feet to accommodate. And if you actually go there, the front of the organ looks quite convincing. You walk around the side and you realise it was designed in two dimensions only. Oh, I should say that the other thing that contributes to the delay, of course, is that an electrical action is not immediate. Uh, the best uh, actions now still have a delay of about 20 milliseconds. The less good ones a bit longer. Um, now, let's talk about building reverberation. Uh, well, it's, this is a slightly different to the anechoic chamber you were in. <laughs> uh, there's quite a lot of reverberation here, much more than we normally have. And indeed, it was uh, Henry Willis, who originally built this organ for the Great Exhibition, who coined the phrase, the most important stop on the organ is the sound of the building. He's known to have exhibited a marked lack of enthusiasm when asked to build an organ in a non-reverberant church. As we've already said, the reflections that make up reverberation do have problems of position. But quite apart from scientific considerations, it's obviously much more satisfactory to perform music in the same acoustic ambience as was expected by its creator. And I can certainly say that uh, it is an unforgettable experience to go to Leipzig and listen to a Bach cantata in St. Thomas's Church in Leipzig, which is where um, Bach was the director of music and for which he wrote the cantatas. I mean, his basic thing is, oh, I've got a choir coming on Sunday, I better write something. Uh, for no very obvious reason, other than expectation born out of past experience, we prefer the reverberation of a big building to be longer than that of a smaller one. And Stevens and Bate expressed this as a mathematical formula, which I put into a graph, um, which is a log scale graph, so to get some straight lines out of it. Um, and basically, uh, a big building, you expect a long reverberation time. It's a, it's a mental thing rather than a, physical, rather than a, a scientific thing. Um, the other side, of course, is um, a, a absorption. The greater the absorption, the louder the organ will have to be to create the same musical effect, since the direct sound will have less reflected sound to back it up. This causes problems. In the case of new buildings, uh, late changes in the specifications of surfaces can upset the design of organs under construction. This caused problems at the Royal Festival Hall, where a number of surfaces proved to be more absorbent than the acoustician Hope Bagger had originally planned. At the Bridgewater Hall in Manchester, which I mentioned earlier, there was apparently poor liaison between the hall authorities and the organ builder who was in Denmark. Opposite can result from changes to the building many years after construction. The large and cavernous chapel of the Royal Hospital School of Holbrook was built in 1932 and has a cathedral sized organ with a considerable reputation for its abilities in the performance of 19th and early 20th century music. The chapel was originally lined with an acoustic finish, now clogged up with paint. Musicians love the five-second reverberation, but full organ is now overwhelming. Of course, the organ builder can just make a mistake. In the 1930s, the speciality of the Compton Company had been in overcoming the problems of voicing organs buried in chambers. But at St. Albans Church Hoban in 1960, they had the opportunity to build an organ in an open position on the elevated west gallery of the church with a long reverberation. Not realising the change in acoustic circumstances, they kept to the usual style, 
and at first still, the organ was easily the loudest organ in London. And of course, treble and bass. Organ rooms of long known large lidded windows absorb bass, low frequencies, as in here, for example. Uh, the problems with the bass in the festival hall, which I've already mentioned, were due to a particular theory of Hope Bagginal, who had a horror of what he called bathroom acoustics. Until the recent alteration, the fundamental of an organ pipe sounded 16 hertz, which you heard very soft one. That very soft note that you heard here was quite inaudible in the Festival Hall. You can hear it now, since the acoustics have been changed, but you couldn't hear it then. A more difficult problem arises by the recent fashion of covering entirely wooden church floors with carpet, particularly if it's placed immediately in front of the organ. The absorption coefficients of 0.6 at 2 kHz and 0.7 at 4 kHz are worse than carpet. Not only does this substantially reduce the reinforcement of sound by reflection, but introduces substantial skew for the treble of bass balance. Since this problem is normally encountered as a retrofit, affecting already installed organs, there's virtually no corrective action can be applied to the organ itself. And the carpet you see there at Notting Hill has recently been removed, and interestingly, the church is now used for a house by the Monteverdi Choir, such as the improvement in the acoustic. There is a more important but more subtle effect on the tone of an organ, which results from the absorption of sound by the atmosphere at high frequencies. This varies somewhat with the relative humidity of the air, being higher at low humidity, but is shown in the figure which is shown in, which is based on a table by Evans and Basley. Um, interestingly enough, it doesn't vary, if you look at the equations, it doesn't vary with the size of the building, it varies with the reverberation. So that in this building, which has got a, a good long reverberation, there's quite a big cutoff at high frequencies. Uh, and that clearly affects, uh, has to affect the style of the organ, or should do, but a lot of people don't know about this. It's, it's a high frequency filter. So the musical result is that the style of voicing, that's the setting the sound of the organ, the style of voicing appropriate to a reverberant Gothic Abbey will sound hard and aggressive in a more intimate environment. And this occurred in the organ by Grand Duke of the Bradbury in the chapel underneath the Palace of Westminster. And the replacement organ by William Drake, at which I was a consultant, was designed to have a deliberately less aggressive sound than its predecessor. And that, that's how we got over it. But the, the organ that was unsatisfactory there, interestingly, was then sold to a church with a long reverberation, but they're very happy with it. So in the next section, I'll describe the tools available to the organ designer to achieve the best results. Well, the first thing organ builders do, of course, is to uh, minimise the uh, effect of the organ case. Um, that looks very solid, doesn't it? Uh, that was made in 1704 between Anne's private chapel in Windsor. It isn't there now because uh, when Queen Anne died and George I came along, he decided it was all too popish and he closed Windsor down. So the, um, the dean of the chapel royal, who was without a job, uh, got a new job as vicar of Findham in Northamptonshire and took the organ with him and it's still there. But the front pipes do act as a bit of a high filter. And that's looking from the inside looking out. And you can see that the, the, the actual uh, screen of the, of the case is much less of an acoustic screen than you supposed it was. Um, they obviously the front pipes do reduce transmission of sound with less than 0.1 of a metre, that is from about 3 kilohertz up. In America, there was an organ who got really worried about this. Uh, his name was Walter Heltkamp, and he put the front pipes at the back. And that's the organ in the MIT chapel at Boston, built in 1955. Um, this arrangement is also used 
in the Fistful Hall in London, although it wasn't done by Walter Holtkamp, it was more by accident than design. But that's the way things work. I, I, I could bore you with the story, but perhaps time is pressing. Uh, and the other thing is that organs under a low roof need height above the pipes is the sound they get out. And so organ builders tend to provide then a minimum of casework in order to maximise the sound transmission. And back to Notting Hill, that's how the organ used to be. Now, the effect of the roof on the case. Up to about 1820, it was usual for organ cases to be moved in. Though originally provided more to keep out the dust and for acoustic reasons, roofs have been found to have important acoustical effects when an organ is freestanding, i.e. not within an enclosure. For this reason, some present-day organ builders now provide case roofs whenever possible and replace them on old, old organs when they've been removed. And the new organ was to the people who've got a roof to the case. Some theorise that vibrations in the case panelling can have a beneficial effect. I think that's rubbish. Others have suggested that a complete enclosing case could constitute a Helmholtz resonator. If you actually work it out, you find the resonant frequency of such a resonator is well below the audible range. The real effect of the case roof isn't really very widely understood, but it, because it basically provides early reflection of sound, it's emitted vertically from the top of the pipe. This increases the position of the sound of an organ standing on our roof. I'll just to show you how that is, there's the sound going directly, and there it is reflected off the roof. But of course, if um, you don't have a roof, and the roof and the ceiling is a long way up. The sound reflected will be delayed 60 milliseconds and will sound uh, much less precise. Now, that's good for some music and bad for others. Um, there's a balance there. Um, and for example, the new organ in Keble College Chapel, Oxford, which is behind an old case, it retains a Victorian appearance and has no case roof. Sound travelling up nearly 10 metres. This considerably reduces the precision, and the organ is extremely good for Elgar, but not quite so good for Bach. Wind pressure. Most organs are voiced on a wind pressure of between 55 millimetres and 100 millimetres of water. In the past, by the way, comparable, that's comparable to the pressure of the gas main, to give you some idea of what it is. In the past, the upper limit was set by both the manpower required to pump the wind and by the fact that the pallet valves controlling the wind supply to the pipes require more effort to move if the wind pressure is increased, making the keys heavy to play. Um, in 1840, the, um, no, 18, yeah, 1845, the organist of York Minster complained that uh, it was the keys of his organ were so heavy that playing the organ was labour fit for a horse. <laughs> Engineering developments in the 19th and early 20th century eased these restrictions because electrically powered fan blowers are now universal and electric or electro-pneumatic actions isolate the effort required to operate the keys from that required to open the pallet valve that admit air to the pipes. These facilities were used in the design of the organs made to accompany silent films in the 1920s. Cinemas had padded seats and a low volume per seat, yielding high acoustic absorption and short reverberation times. Commercial considerations meant that the organs had relatively few pipes, but used relatively high wind pressure, typically 250 millimetres of water, to generate a powerful sound. They were also used more reed pipes, relative to the number of flue pipes, as reed pipes have a more aggressive sound, as you heard when I played those very low notes. Um, we've talked about electrical key actions. In fact, the use of mechanical key action has undergone a revival in the last 50 years, partly because uh, the engineering has been improved, so they did, they're not quite so heavy to play. But despite that, um, church and concert instruments tend to be limited to a maximum of about 100 millimetre wind pressure. 
pipe scales. Now, perhaps I need to explain what this is about. Um, the diameter of the body of an organ pipe, which we call the scale, is the most important factor in controlling the tone quality. This is because the higher resonances of air, the air in the pipe are not perfectly in tune with the harmonics of the fundamental and are therefore not exciting. For a given pitch, the greater the diameter of the pipe, the greater the end correction, and the more pronounced its effect, and therefore the flute in the resulting tone. Uh, the converse are the smaller pipe scales used 200 years ago for house organs. And uh, even present day organ builders use similar scales for organist practice instruments. Um, we've seen that the dinner of verbal building, the acoustic absorption in the air itself starts to become significant in the tone. So the instrument needs to put out extra energy in the upper range. Whereas in an acoustically dead building, one's got to hold up back the upper harmonics of the treble pipes or they'll scream. My grandfather evolved two basic scaling methods to cope with this. Um, and I won't give you the, the technical details, but basically, if you had a, a building like this with a high reverberation, um, but quite a lot of absorption in the base, you check the, the pipe spatter in the base and and slimmer in the treble. In the building with low reverberation, it had less absorption in the base than you had some really big windows, um, and uh, because you didn't have the absorption of the upper frequencies, then you made the, the higher pipes bigger and therefore flutier. Another thing, control that the organ builder has is, is a device, a thing called the cutter. That is the height of the map of the pipe. If you look at those up there, you can see the mouth going across the front of the pipe. I should point out, by the way, that it's only the bit above the mouth that controls the pitch. The tape of the bit underneath the pipe is merely there to hold the rest of it up. Um, but the height of that mouth is, is an important thing. It governs the edge tone, which is a basic vibration which is amplified and controlled by the air column in the pipe. And the low cut gives a non-aggressive sound, such as like non reverberant values, and the higher cut gives a harder sound. And there was a problem, and the organ builder failed to change his style to, to match the acoustic. And for example, um, fairly recently, a Swiss organ builder built the organ for the chapel of Jesus College, Cambridge, and didn't adapt his style, and the result is not good. And another thing you can do is to vary the tuning temperament. Now, if I were to give you a lecture on musical temperament, we would be here till midnight. Uh, but the musical scale poses a problem with the integral of a major third. Um, it's a mathematical thing. The ratio of frequency of two notes to a major third apart is five to four. If you hold three successive thirds, that makes an octave. If you multiply 504 by 504 by 504, you end up with 125 over 64, which is not 2, slightly less than 2. Therefore, uh, you've got uh, an error that's got to be distributed in some way over those thirds. And that is a problem with the organ, because we have some parts in an organ that play a third away from the fundamental. So you've got a dissonance when a chord is played with a tenth of third in your hand, but one of the pipes, or well, some of the pipes, are tuned to a pure third. And so those two pipes are going to be out of tune. That's what I call the angry thirds. Uh, and the extent of the distance in the common keys that most musicians play with depend on the tuning temperament. And I'll just do a little graph here. Um, if you go back to the 1600s, they tuned the thirds in the only keys that the music was played in, absolutely dead in tune. And then people like Bach said, well, I want to play music in other keys. So they started to modify it. And they got eight keys, which were only a modest error, and four keys where it was a huge error. And that's known uh, as either the um, uh, sixth column mean tone or the Silverman temperament. 
And that's the temperament that was known to Bach, and it's what most organs are attuned to in this country up till about 1850. And then people said, well, we want to be able to play in any key. But of course, to do that, you've got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So in order to avoid those dissonances, all the major thirds have got an error of about 14% of a semitone. And um, Chopin was very upset with the piano was really tuned, really equal really cool temperament. Now, the interesting thing is, the acid that I've talked about livens up the tone and the reverb of a building like this. This organ is tuned in equal temperament. I, I won't bother to dem demonstrate that. And organ tunes used to equal temperament. Uh, East tuning organs in large buildings all strongly favour equal temperament. I know that the tuners of the organs of Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral are both personal friends of mine, and they're firmly in this camp, and they won't hear anything else. But the sharp thirds are unpleasant in intimate and non reverberant acoustics. And we find organ builders whose main work is in more intimate and non reverberant buildings find the angry thirds intolerable and refuse to use equal temperament. So that's a problem. And uh, let's go back to our, our graph. Now let's add to the graph. There was a character called Thomas Young who so very nearly translated the Rosetta Stone in the early 19th century. And he developed a, an in-between temperament. And you could see that it gave you in the... Um, it gave you, in the most common keys, it, gave, it, it, was, it was quite good. And then the, it started to deteriorate on the shoulders, but of course the worst keys weren't really in bed. And um, that was used by the late William Drake for the, his new organs in the crypt of the Chapel of the Houses of Parliament, and also the crypt chapel of um, St Paul's Cathedral. And what we're seeing now is an increasing use of in-between temperaments. Um, because when I was taught to tune, it, it was all a basis of, of listening and, and listening to intervals. But now, they, then, of course, people started to build, buy expensive electronic tuners with all sorts of different tunings in them. They don't bother now because it's a, it's a 99p app for your iPhone. <laughs> Uh, so people use in between temperaments now, and uh, that is uh, Needhart, which is um, uh, again reduces the error in the in the worst keys, um, but at the expense of increasing the error in some of the in between keys, uh, and that appears to be. A very acceptable compromise. It's been used in the new American built organ in, uh, in St George's Hanover Square, and I've used it in, in, on, on a number of occasions, um, in particular the new organ at West Twittering Church near Chichester, um, which is a very intimate environment, and, and they seem very happy with that. And finally, we come on to the whole question of how big an organ. When John Goss, I think it's Sir John Goss, was appointed organist of St Paul's Cathedral in 1838, he had the temerity to inquire about the possibility of adding another stop to the 1697 organ. Sir Sidney Smith, a very grand canon, was determined to put down the young upstart. What a strange set of creatures you organists are. First you want the bull stop, then you want the Tom Tip stop. In fact, you are like a jaded cab horse, always asking for another stop. The plain fact is that the more stops there are, the more fun the instrument is to play. But in practice, we also need to relate the size of the organ stop list to the acoustic power needed. Incidentally, one might have thought that this need not apply in the case of electronic imitations. The power of such an instrument depends on the power of the amplifiers and the loudspeakers, not on the number of stops. So the cost and space requirements of extra stops are relatively small. Exploiting this situation to su supply a large stop list in a small building can lead to a very considerable mismatch between the stop list and the actual power of the instrument. 
with each site sounding only a tiny fraction of itself in order to prevent the full organ sound becoming overwhelming. And the result invariably sounded artificial. But the right size of an organ can be calculated. Um, in calculating uh, the ideal size of an organ from the given acoustic, one must disregard the number of manuals. Additional manuals add tone possibilities and flexibility of performance, but relatively few decibels. I was planning to go up and demonstrate this to you, but rather than hold you up unduly, I'll perhaps do that at the end of the talk, rather than uh, uh, interrupt at this point. Just to say that uh, organs have more than one set of keys. And one of the reasons why they have more than one set of keys is that it's very much easier to change the sound quickly by moving your hands to a different row of keys than by moving stops in and out. Um, and, therefore, and of course you can do solo and accompaniment. So that is why most organs have more than one set of keys. And the cathedral organs mostly have four sets. Um, so additional sets of keys don't actually make the organ loud, and I'll demonstrate that later on. But if we base the calculation on the size of the great organ, which on is the main division, it's used to account for congregational singing. And for an organ in a roof case with a prominent open position on the main axis of the building, experience has shown that a, a, a preference for one stop on the great organ every thousand square foot of absorption units. I'm afraid this calculation is old mode, but it's a useful simple rule of thumb. Thus, a church 120 foot long, 50 foot wide, and an average 30 foot high, the reverberation with congregation, one and a half seconds, 6,000 square foot units, six stops on the great hall. And in terms of the actual number of stops, uh, I've shown what that amounts to on a one manual organ and a, and a two manual organ that would produce about the same amount of power. Of course, if the organ uh, not free standing, it may need to be bigger, and you can make adjustments to the wind pressures and voicing if the organ is a little bit too big uh, for the calculation, but there's a limit to how much you can do that. So, in conclusion, I want to say that the acoustic space inhabited by an organ will have a major effect on the musical result. Some external factors can be taken into account in the design, but not all can be compensated for, particularly if people make changes after the organ is built. And the acoustical factors that must be taken into account is the mechanism by which the case roof affects the sound, the calculation of the optimum number of stops, and the choice of pipe scales cut up in temperament to allow for the lack of the treble filter when the reverberation time is short. And unfortunately, that last factor, until very recently, has not been widely understood. Thank you. I'll just now go up and just demonstrate the effect of different manuals for you, uh, and then that will be the end of the talk. And thank you very much for being a good audience.